I'm going to get us started and then pretty quickly switch over to Emily and then we'll come back over to me um, for the end, the long end, because that is a cool study of my mouth. Um, and I just want to say I am super grateful for like the large turnout we have and for how many of you are contractors. It is great to see you. It's great to have you in the community and you know committed to doing this. Um, so for faces that I've known for years, it's good to see you. And for new faces, welcome. Um, so some learning objectives. Um, after you leave here, I think you should be able to explain what a net zero energy home is. Identify some of the commonly used strategies that builders in our community are using to achieve that status. Um, help homeowners make decisions about natural gas and batteries as part of their project. Um, differentiate between off-grid and grid tied projects and some of the upfront planning issues for each of those. Uh, discuss the impact of the homeowner on the likelihood of actually achieving net zero energy. Um, and then explain some successes and lessons learned um, from actually both of our personal projects. Emily and I both live in net zero energy homes that we built around the same time. Um, and I think we've actually had many of the same um, successes and lessons learned. So first off, um, I want to talk about what is a net zero energy home. And this is just a little graph of actually my houses and energy use for, for a one year period. So what happens in, in homes in our, in our climate or location is your solar TV array is going to produce the most when you have longer days. Um, and actually what it really likes is a cooler long day because electronics don't love being hot. So you get the most in the spring, summer, and fall, and then you get the least in the wintertime. So that's the red is my production, um, and it also depends how cloudy it is. So you can kind of see August and September may be a little lower than it has been in some other years. I think it must have been cloudy, but you can see that like from about April to October, we get pretty high production. Um, and it actually drops off quite a bit in June on my January and February bills. I also, in January, when the sun's at its lowest, get a little bit of shading that I don't get any other time of year. So that makes, it's the shortest days and I get some shading. So that makes my production a little low that much. Um, and then what happens with our usage is we use the most when we're heating. We use the least when we're not doing any heating or cooling of the spring and fall. And then we use a little bit more, August, September is actually when my AC bill tends to be the highest. Um, so the usage is the LA, you can see that pops up a little bit in August, September. So a net zero energy home is, if you add up all the yellow and all the red for a year, they're about the same. Um, but in any given month, I might produce more than I make, in say like May, June especially. Um, and in other months, I might use a lot more than I produce. So like in January, February, I'm using like twice as much as I produce. But over the year, I can get pretty close to zero. What's the size of your array? I have a six point something kilowatt array. I think it's like six point five. Um, and we will talk about this. It needs to be a little bigger because I just got an electric car. Um, okay, so. And as a lot of you know, we do Green Belt certification. There is actually a certification for Net Zero Energy Ready and Net Zero Energy Certified Home. Um, so how do we know during construction that a house can be what we call Net Zero Energy Ready? Um, the Green Belt certification has a way that we've been defining this, and we've been doing this for probably eight years now. And I feel like it's worked out pretty well. Um, so there's this thing called the HERS Index, a HERS of about 100 is just built to code, um, and a HERS of zero is a house that is maybe technically net zero energy with a typical, fairly wasteful American living in the house. Um, to be what's considered net zero energy ready, which is kind of everything but the solar, um, Greenville would like your house to come in at a HERS of 55 or lower. So you're already using about half the energy, maybe a little more, than you would be if you just built to code. Because 
it's usually a lot cheaper to get your savings from efficiency until that starts to hit the law of diminishing returns and then put on solar. So we build a pretty efficient house, pretty solar. Um, we need to have some roofs that's within 45 degrees of south. And truthfully, even if you have to go the whole way to east or west, the production of your PV doesn't drop off too much as long as it's not shaded. Um, and they would like you as a rule of thumb to have 110 square feet of roof per 2,000 square feet of conditioned space. Um, and a chase and a metal conduit. Um, and they're going to be tweaking that in the new upgrade of Greenville Homes when it comes out. And I think an acceptable alternative will probably be something called a combination electric meter, which is a meter that lets you plug solar into it from outside without coming inside and going to your panel. Um, so that's maybe another option. And I've already had them allowed on a case-by-case -case basis for some really small houses where the solar arrays, arrays like right adjacent to where the outside meter is. Um, how do we know prior to people moving in the house to be net zero energy? And there are a few people in this room who have actually built net zero certified homes. Um, so that's defined by the certification. With solar, we want you to get a first rating of 15 or lower. So you remember I said zero means net zero energy with kind of a typical wasteful American living in it. What we have found is that the people who live in net zero certified homes are usually people who conserve energy as part of their daily life. They buy energy star appliances, they turn their lights off when they leave the room. Um, all of their behaviors add up to something. And we've generally found that if you can get to a Hertz 15 or lower, most people can function as net zero. My house was a 14, and without my car, I'm pretty close. I'm like, do you remember what yours was? No. I say it was like an 11 or 12. Yeah. Um, and so the average PV install that we're seeing, it does depend on the size of the house. It's probably about six to seven kilowatts. And that hasn't really changed over the years. Um, and we feel like an efficient homeowner can, can make that happen. So um, I'm gonna have Emily take over and talk you through the strategies. She's a contractor who has actually done this. How many times have you done it at zero? Almost all of them. I don't think it's, yeah, it's eight or she's six. done it a few times. Um, and we've got some strategies up here. Y'all are gonna recognize some of your own companies or companies that you know in the photos. Um, and you know, I think really for the, this is a great time to kind of butt in with questions on any of the strategies because we've both seen a lot more than it's on here. So Anyway. Hi everybody. Um, I'm kind of curious how many people here actually work in the industry and if we have any homeowners or people who are wanting to build for themselves here. Um, here yeah, I'm wanting to build for myself. Wanting to build for myself. Yeah. Okay. Um, anybody else who's not a builder? Sweet. Okay, just wanted to feel that out because there might be different things that point out for you guys versus the builders. Um, so, and please do just ask questions throughout if you have them. Like, it's perfectly acceptable. So, um, this is kind of just the title slide. This picture is of a very, very energy efficient home, um, Ben Edson's house. Um, the caption is four forms of solar energy in use. So, they have um, there's a passive solar house where he has a slab for thermal mass there, slab on great foundation. This is the south side of his house. Um, up there we have the solar panels and uh, hot water panels over there above this, the garage side of the house over there. Um, hot water. And then they're using the sun to dry their clothes. Um, yeah, then, so that's a winter, winter shot, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, you can. It, that's like right at noon in the winter. You can see the sun almost perfectly coming in those windows. Yeah, that Ben was really involved in that. That's <laughs> the design. And, at the time, he was a solar salesman. Um, so yeah, um, and he's very energy conscious, um, which is interesting. I'll talk more about it later. But the 
I find that clients are, some are very energy conscious and some are not at all. And I'll talk more about different ways that I approach net zero with different clients. Um, so small, Ben's house in this picture was really very small. I think it had maybe one or maybe two proper bedrooms. No, it had three bedrooms, but it was only like 1,400 square feet. It had really small bedrooms. Insulate well, that's incredibly important. I think we'll go in more depth on yeah, all these are just the strategies yeah. that you'll expand on. Um, orient for passive solar and active solar, which they work well together, so the same orientation. High efficiency HVAC, um, efficient domestic hot water, and uh, managing the occupants and appliances. One thing I noticed on Ben's roof is that the angle is not really an optimized pitch. Is so there a remote process was for that? Yeah, um, I can tell you because my husband designed it. And, you know, they designed it, it's a small house and they designed it to do really specific things, and that angle worked the best for the inside space. And you can sort of angle the solar differently, but it actually also doesn't make a ton of difference if you're a little off. So it was more of an interior position. It really doesn't matter as much now as it used to. Mm -hmm. And PV is a little more forgiving than hot water. Um, so build smaller. That's one of the key guiding houses. They can really create small, very efficient houses. Um, so that's a great place to start, is working on kind of optimizing the footprint of the house. Um, so this one is 1134 square feet. Um, it was net zero with only 3.8 kilowatts of PV, which is a really small, really affordable system. Um, ended up with a HERS of eight. There's And the certificate showing eight year. It says a year. Uh, it was probably about eight or nine years ago. Is yeah, that Boone like, Guidance House? It's one of the ones that he built. It's not a show. personal house. It might be a rental. It's a, yeah, he's got another one right beside it. Yeah. So a really small, very <laughs> small house. And this one is only 600 square feet. I think the Boom Guyton house was on two floors is the difference, because mm. they look about the same size. Yes, that's a lot of Yeah, so he's got like 550 <coughs> per level there. Um, so he ends up with more square footage than this one. That's 600. Um, and this one has uh, a version of two with about the same size system. That has a slab or a twelve foot? That one's on Interior pictures of how they optimize the small footprint of the loft. Open kitchen. Yeah, so I can say a few more things about that sure. last one. So they really optimize the footprint. Um, it's a single older woman who lives in it. She travels a lot, but she has the loft that she never goes in. But if her kids come to visit, they sleep up there. Um, there's one bathroom. Her bedroom has just a twin bed in it. Um, you can see kind of the cabinets, and there's a lot of built-ins, and it has a galley kitchen, which is a really efficient kitchen layout, but they're also super usable. Um, I've had them, and they, they do a lot in a small amount of space. So they probably, the one thing that stood out for me the most about this house was just how much time the builder and the homeowner spent trying to optimize every square foot of the full time. And even modern, Currently, with having an open floor plan is um, what people are looking for, and that is it makes it easier to do small footprints in small spaces. Um, so it kind of just works out really well. Yeah, you can really take out good. walls and you can have a small house. Yeah, I think that had one wall that would make split. So insulate well. This is really important, and I'm sure. <clears throat> All the builders in here 
talk about this a lot with like me or whoever your reader is. Um, but this picture is superior walls um, and slab, under slab insulation before the base of the slab has been poured. You can see the whole slab is insulated underneath, um, except where there are point loads. <coughs> There's no insulation. Um, but that prevents heat loss out the floor. The floor is nice and warm. Usually the concrete floor on the lower level is the finished floor. So um, for occupant comfort, it's nice to have the whole slab insulated. You don't have to do that. We've done that zero homes with just the perimeter insulation. Um, but it's really nice to have the whole slab insulated. It doesn't cost much more. Um, Superior walls are also a really great way to get the basement walls insulated without having to figure out how to effectively insulate block. Um, we've done both. Every house we do is different. We just look at the situation. Um, yeah, that's the site, the budget, and all that on every house. But I, I really do like superior walls where they make sense. Um, so, like the foam board to the uh, cavities. I don't add foam board, I'll add fiberglass backs inside the walls. Not very many of the chains, but you could add two inches and get right up to the chase of the wire chase. I don't know if that's the same. I think you could, yeah. I, most people just add fiberglass. That's what I do in my house. And honestly, for those of you who are builders, if the budget gets super tight, add fiberglass to the walls that are above grade and mostly above grade, and then you can maybe skip it in the parts that are way below grade. That's kind of a good trade off. Yes. Insulation. I yeah, but are the foam board sheets, I guess they are insulation. Those are four by eight sheets of foam, probably two inch thick foam taped at the seams. That provide um, the paper barriers and the little you can use it as your vapor barrier, but in this climate, I like to also use plastic. I don't think it hurts to have to. So these are SIPS panels, which provide great insulation value when not a lot of thermal breaks. Which Amy, I think, will talk more about SIPS. When she yeah, this is a photo of my house, actually. Um, that's Red Deer. Um, I'm trying to see who the other person is. You all might know something important. Okay. So SIPS, it stands for structural insulated panel. So that the, um, the sheet of plywood is the structure, and then it's just foam inside. So you know, no thermal breaks at all. Um, but they're more complicated to go with than just conventional framing. Um, but you are, I think they're I'll talk a little bit about it. I feel yeah. like they're easiest on roofs, and then they do get So spray foam insulation, um, we use that a lot in our houses. It's not really that much more expensive than fiberglass, and it really helps with your lower darkness and the air tightness. Um, who's, who's your foam insulator? No. Is quite a good one. Um, I was using Delco, and I love Delco. They were great, but so they went out of business, and we've been going between companies since then. Most recently, we used um, a new company, Asheville Spray Foam. I can get anybody to contact them, they're really great. Um, they just did a house for us, and interestingly, they bought a truck from somebody else, but it's Delco's old truck and old equipment. Um, but I was really happy with them, both the price and the, um, the professionalism. You know, the people who we hired were the people who were there to ask us how it looked. You know, a lot of times you'll, you have somebody come through and quote it and somebody else shows up to spray it and there's nobody really to talk to. But anyway, they're great. I'm happy to share that. Um, so spray them. If you're already planning to do air sealing, like air barrier or something like that, then do you still find this to be a good choice over something cheaper? Like, where is air barrier? Was that on the outside? Um, I do it from the inside. Oh, oh right. inside. I got air sealing. So we just house. got it in yeah. this market recently. I haven't tried it yet because we are already getting the um, same results that they are getting without using their product. 
but that's we've been doing it for a long time. So anyway, for me, it would be adding or, or just changing. I don't know. Um, yeah, it might work really well. It, usually what I tell people is spray foam really makes fan choice more airtight, cantilever floors, roofs, unless you have a really simple flat ceiling line. Um, spray foam really makes a difference. On walls, spray foam doesn't actually make so much of a difference unless it's a gut renovation, in which case I would air barrier it all the way on a gut renovation now that we have it. Um, if you've got paneling instead of gravel on your walls, it would be a good idea to do spray foam. Um, or just really complicated walls with like a lot of blocking in them. Um, you can't get bats in there really well. I would either do a blown sailors or one of glass or spray foam. Um, but in general, where walls need spray foam doesn't help you. Um, so I like to do a lot of hybrid houses with foam roofs, foam bales, and floors, and carpet glass walls. If you've got a super simple ceiling line where it's just a flat ceiling, you can vent the attic and just do balloon fiberglass, but you do have to take some extra steps to seal the ceiling. And I think you could use a barrier there as your strategy or you know, old school ceiling techniques either way. We do a fair amount of hybrid where it's from the roof and the band and fiberglass and walls. My house has balloon and bats and walls. But sometimes you just have to get quotes and see, yeah. and sometimes you'll find that somebody wants, somebody would just rather spray it all so they can do a good price because they don't want to bring the spray truck out and have somebody else from come in and put in fiberglass. And that's especially true for small houses. How about COVID versus closed out? You probably use it yeah. Open um, upgrade walls, close cell phone basement walls. And under slabs, once we sprayed uh, under our slab, instead of doing the rigid foam boards that are taped to the seams, that was when we were using Delco, they sprayed under our slabs for us. And I haven't found anybody yeah. to do that. But I think uh, on the next one we do, I'm going to try to find somebody to spray. Yeah, no, but it, you don't have all those taped seams, and then at the edges, it's a little bit easier to get the edges enslaved. Sometimes that edge detail can be hard to do with foam boards. Mm -hmm. um, I was just really happy with it when we, when we did it. Um, <coughs> So, there's a two by four wall with rigid insulation on the interior. Which is not usual, but And so it's the reason, in addition to insulation, the reason you would put that um, rigid insulation inside or outside the frame is to reduce the um, thermal break of the studs. Um, sealed crawl space. You need to make sure those are insulated well. Concrete walls, uh, I think are insulated really well. I know that on this particular house, I love this house, I think they had a lot of volunteer labor though, so I think that if you were actually going to pay for the labor, that this would not be a cost effective way to get your insulation. It is a great product and it's very pretty, but I have never tried it. General thoughts on insulation, that is Amy's house. No, that's no, been it's not. Cells. Oh, that's been it. That's my four hours of solar cells too. That's a steel soap with EPS. You said steel? Yeah, it's steel. It's a steel frame <coughs> set with EPS insulation. Oh. So instead of Amy's house had the um, plywood or OSB panels, that's what you saw here. You're seeing the steel framing with the. Um, Insulation. And this is the south side. If you remember that's the slope of where the TV was. Well, they had a little dormer there. That's the slope at the garage. <coughs> so, how do folks get away from the, the thermal bridge at the uh, we got splines between panels? There's still a little bit of thermal bridge But it's like 5% versus 20% for land. 
So seed code, but don't spend your whole budget. <laughs> That's um, what we we try to do in our houses. We have never used SIPs just because of, we try to use conventional methods that we can hire just the regular framing crew with no special knowledge to build. And then we try to insulate um, above code kind of our approach to, to building the net zero house, but in a conventional way, because it's easier if you can use the labor force that already exists. Air seal really well. Um, these are probably the two most important things I think for getting your insulation and your air sealing down. Um, once your house is finished, you can't really go back and change those things. You need to do it right from the beginning. Um, keep everything in conditioned space. That's um, really important. It's hard. Sometimes with cantilevered floors and you know, um, in general, we have, we're doing a house right now where some of our duct work is not in, in conditioned space because it's in a um, floor. The house is over a carport, so the mm -hmm. truss, a truss floor over the carport, and we've got ducts and below the insulation. Um, I think if I were to do it again, I'd probably try to figure out a way to bring that insulation down below the ducts. Are oh, you just kind of spraying around the ducts? To Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is great from an insulation standpoint, but you can get a situation where you crush a duct. And if you crush a duct with spray foam, it's super hard to get it uncrushed. Would that be a place to use the interior insulation panels in the ceiling to insulate that capsule? Right, maybe. Um, yeah, before they have them on the, on the exterior wall. Right, we could have them on. Underneath the dresses, perhaps before you put the finished ceiling on the carport. Avoid tricky details. So simple is good. Simple is also less expensive. So that's the bonus. So passive solar. Um, this is probably what I'm most passionate about. Um, so there you see a wall of. Oh, is that Erica? That's not um, a wall of windows facing south and a concrete floor that has thermal mass. Um, those are the most important part of passive solar is the glass, and, um, but it's best if you have a thermal storage system of some kind. Um, it doesn't have to be a floor, it could be a concrete wall. Um, there are a lot of ways to do it. Floors are kind of the easiest because you need a floor anyway, so you might as well. And you can do it on any level of a home. This is a second story. This is um, above the basement. In my house, we have three floors. Every floor has concrete. Um, it's really not as heavy as you think it would be. You know, your, um, the Amy's house and my house, we both use truss floors, and your truss designer just sizes the trusses for the load of the concrete. Which is actually the load is more when the concrete's wet. So once it's dry and stiff, it's not really that much of a load on your trusses. So that's four and four or three. I think it's three. And how oh, yours is three? Mine yeah, is just three. a double. It's pretty easy to do a double bottom plate and then you just And I think just structurally, I, what I remember is we had to go from 19 to one center to 16 on center with our floor trusses, and that was all. It, concrete's heavy, but it's spread out. What's harder for structures is when you have a bunch of weight in one location. <laughs> if it's nice enough to spread itself out, it's not really such a big deal. Yeah. That's why when it's wet, it's an issue because it's like going in and uneven. Well, it's heavier and it's water ways along. going in and uneven over the um, There's another photo of being sus finished. So this is looking at it from the, the other direction. Um, I guess we're looking west here. Now we're looking east at the same wall, but after the house has been finished. And then this is just a nice touch. They have clear story windows on the north side up high for daylight to allow light through there. Um, this is my house. Um, that's the south side. So we have lots of windows in all our rooms. 
main floor is wide open, so in the winter that sunlight penetrates all the way to the back. I think sun can penetrate about 19 feet in. I haven't looked up the exact figure in a while. It's 18 in our house. It depends 18. how big your window is. Basically, how far you window is. It's 18 in my house. Yeah. Um, so, what I try to do is um, cluster closets, pantries, bathrooms, stairs. All of that on the north side and have all the living space on the south as much as possible so that you get that passive solar effect in the space that you're actually in. Um, and you don't really want windows in the closets, so, or at least not lots of them. Um, so these two, these two houses both have thermal mass, and that's what makes them passive solar as opposed to sun tempered. Sun tempered is when you use the same kind of orientation as. Um, as you do in passive solar, but you don't have the storage capacity for that. Um, so in, with the storage in passive solar, the, the slab will absorb the sun and the warmth in the daytime and radiate it back out at night. Um, so sun tempered is a, it works in a similar way, just without the storage capacity. And I want to say one other thing about the passive solar. The, the thermal mass is really great in the summer too. It just modulates temperature, keeps your house from having swings. Um, I can't say enough about thermal mass in houses. Yeah. Anybody who is thinking about designing or building their own home, really consider thermal mass or comfort. Um, so this is a picture of a sun-tempered house. So it has a lot of glass on the south side here which just helps with the utility bills. Um, another thing to consider in both passive solar and sun-tempered are your overhangs. You do want to make sure that while you're providing all this glass, um, you're protecting the house from absorbing too much energy when you don't want it in the summer months. Um, so you can do, there are various ways to calculate how um, when the sun will be hitting, what will be coming through the window, what size overhang you need, how far above the window it should be, and how far out it should go. It's just simple geometry, really, but there are online calculators that you need to look, at, look it up there. Um, just, but that's important to consider. You don't want to do just a wall of glass without um, planning for how to keep the sun out when you don't want it. I wondered if, uh, if he has a sunshade on that west window. A lot of glass yeah, I mean, that's with this design, it's like the bonus room for us would be upstairs. So you get the south windows, but on the upstairs, you have to have the egress on the east and west. So that's this is a way to build a slightly more conventional house, um, but still take advantage of the south, too. It's kind of how I think about these. And there's a few more photos similar, yes, but with the interior stuff. <coughs> This is Davenport Park. I think all of those are sun tempered, all the houses in Jag. Um, that's a little neighborhood that Jag built in West Asheville. So, every, for those of you who haven't seen it, every house faces south or has a side that faces south with a fair amount of glass. And I think most of the houses have PVs also and maybe some with hot water. Yeah, what was great is they built them to be sun tempered, so they all have the south facing roof, and then I went back like three years later and every single one of them had solar on the roof, so that was really cool. Um, high efficiency HVAC. Um, so the most efficient is geothermal. Um, it's really expensive. Um, Amy and I both have it in our houses. We've done our company has put it in um, a lot of our clients' houses when their budget would allow for it. When we built, there were um, tax incentives both at the state level and the federal level, so we got about 65% of the system cost back as direct tax credits, which really brought the cost of the geothermal system down to the same cost as a heat pump. Um, that's not the case anymore. Right now, I think there's only the federal tax credit, and I'm not sure how long it'll last. It may get renewed, I don't know. It's stepping down at the same rate as 
solar. It's exactly the same as the solar federal tax credit. Um, and with the geothermal, you can also do radium floors, which are really nice. So if you've got uh, concrete floors for thermal mass, you can run tubes in them, and then you're, when you do need supplemental heat, um, they can come from hot water running through your floors, which is really nice. It is expensive, but it's really nice. Um, so this is, that's a, a water, or water's water and water to air geothermal unit. I think, that's, is that one in your house? Yeah. The water furnace. So the, the, the unit is capable of taking the groundwater and turning that, um, taking the heat out of the groundwater and turning it into either hot air or hot water or cold air. Um, so that's why it can do both radiant floors and um, hot air with the same unit. Not all of them do that, so if you're considering that, you have to make sure you get the right unit. Or let, let the HVAC person know. Because a lot of times your HVAC company is not the same company that will do your radiant floors, so you need to just make sure people know that's your goal if you want to do that. Some subdivisions are requiring geothermal, I mean, all of it at least requires that all the houses built out there use geothermal. A ductless mini split is um, also very efficient. Is it as efficient as geothermal? The best mini splits are pretty comparable to middle of the road geothermal. Um, and this is for smaller homes. Some, we've used we just did mini splits in a house that's not super small. It was about 1,800, 1,850 square feet, um, simply because the homeowners didn't want ducts. And um, it, it worked out really well. We ended up doing using a unit, uh, an outdoor unit that could also provide hot water. So they ended up going with radiant floors and having AC wall-mounted units from the same outdoor units. Um, and that house ended up with a her score of negative 22. I don't know that it's entirely due to the um, HVAC. We also oversized it um, for future electric cars, but um, there are ways to get creative with your HVAC um, on that one. Um, it was actually the first time Sundance had ever installed the system. We were They've always used gas for radio floors. Um, we're trying to not use gas at all in any of our houses because um, it's a non-renewable resource. So we're really trying to shift all of our energy use to electricity. Um, so I was trying to find a system that could do radiant floors um, with electricity. And they found this one system, I think it's German, and it was the first time they installed it. So far, we're really happy with the system. There were definitely learning curves along the way um, on their part, but they were willing to to be there and troubleshoot, and um, I think they're really proud of the system. And they said they're going to try. Somebody else is not going to try to move away from gas on their radiant floor systems, and hopefully use this system more in the future. So there's a mini split on the wall by the door there. Some people can't stand the look of them, so you kind of have to ask your client. You can't. Well, I don't, that should not be the reason that you don't do them because they yeah. make ceiling cassettes that sit above the mm -hmm. ceiling and it almost just looks like a fancy return. Yeah. Um, and they make ducted ones that you can duct a short distance. So, like, if you don't like the way that unit looks, that's not the reason not to do them. So, the ceiling cassette is actually just dependent on the attic? Yeah, it's. Condition attic? The, the cassette itself is like this big, so it just sits up in the ceiling. If you have a big enough like ceiling structure, you can actually just insulate behind it. I mean, it, it's literally like eight inches deep, so it, it just sits up between the framing numbers. Uh, so what what actually protrudes down from the ceiling? Very it little. looks like a fancy return. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so a high efficiency heat pump. Um, that's what we do actually in most of our houses because it costs the least um, and most clients don't want to pay extra for the extra comfort of bringing the floors. But 
Um, what I always do is just go above code. It's not a whole lot more to get a more efficient um, heat pump. I, for years, I haven't installed anything less than a 16 seer unit. I'm thinking we might start bumping that up a little bit because code is bumping up. Um, but 16 seer is kind of our base and it's served pretty well as a just standard. Furnace, off grid, or on generator. You can explain what you mean. Oh, yeah. So, um, some people do still use gas furnaces. Um, the main reasons, and uh, we've got another slide where we talk more about gas, but the main reasons people use furnaces are if your house needs to be off grid or if you need to put it on a generator. Um, if your house needs to be off grid, if you remember that very first slide that I showed you where it showed that I produce very little in the winter time but I use the most in the winter time that's fine to be net zero energy throughout the year but if you're off grid in any like three day period you need to make all the electricity that you're using for the next three day period so you need to have a lot more solar or you need a way to move some of your heating load off the solar um, so most people who are off-grid actually use some gas. Mo honestly, most of them use it at, in a, with a furnace, or some of them need it wood. Um, and a lot of them use gas with their hot water heating too. So they're actually maybe not truly net zero because they're using fossil fuels, but it's a way to get people off-grid if they need to be. Um, and if you're on a generator, heat pumps take a lot of generator power. Um, because that heat pump uses a lot of electricity. It's on, but furnaces use very little. You just need a little bit of electricity to run the fan. So if somebody needs to have their heat on a generator, a lot of times we will put in a heat pump with a gas furnace backup, and then the furnace is what operates off the generator. Have you seen people actually using their EV to um, you know, solar down on the EV batteries to do the simple loads in the house? I don't actually think you can do that yet. I think that's like a good idea that people are talking about as something we might be able to do, but as far as I know, the technology does not actually exist to do it. And yeah, I mean, it would be easy enough to do it, it's just a battery, it would all be required to do it, but it's not a widget that someone's invented. And it may not be as simple as it sounds because um, like right now, and I think we'll talk about this when we talk about net meter. I'm net metered. When I'm when the grid's down, I'm down because you've got to have a lot of safety stuff in place, not to be putting power potentially into the grid when the power company's working on it. So that you would just need to have some kind of backflow preventer so that your battery wasn't put power on the grid. Okay. Um, so I guess natural gas boilers and good keep makes you use less electricity. Yeah, right. yeah, for radiant heat, there are like less options for how to get hot water. So a lot of people still do use a natural gas boiler. There's the geothermal, and then I think the house Emily told you about where she used the air source for her radiant. It's the first house in Nashville that actually used that system. There was another just the hot water too. I didn't mention that. Yeah, but. there was another system in Black Mountain, like before the recession in like 08, that used a similar system. And then the people who made that system went out of business. And since then, you've been the only other one I've seen. Is a that list of like if you have some other slide that will be addressing indoor air quality, otherwise other than heat, cool, and circulation. I think so. Indoor air quality is not a complete emphasis of this talk, but we obviously don't want people to compromise it to build net zero. Um, so I think we may talk about it a little bit. Um, that's actually a house that has a radiant floor, so that's why you can't really see any heating from the equipment there. Did that one have many splits? I, mean, I, I think it might have had like one ductless for air conditioning. Um, domestic hot water has a huge impact on house performance. Um, so heat pump 
hybrid hot water heaters are um, the most efficient electric water heaters <coughs> right now. That's what we're currently putting in most of our houses. Um, I don't even ask clients. There are a lot of things I don't ask people. I just do them. Because it's like the average homeowner doesn't need to know all the details. They don't need to know what you're doing exactly to make their house efficient. So sometimes, um, you know, I might give them choices on size of heat pump water heat. Choose which size you want, which one you think will make you the most comfortable and will give you the, the peace of mind that you're not going to run out of hot water. But I don't let them choose between a standard water heater and a heat pump water heater. And if you're a builder building a new home, the Duke rebate, if you're in that territory, gives you more rebate than the heat pump water heater costs. So it, from a cost standpoint, it's a no brainer to install one. So it's the brand you use. Whatever Lowe's or Home Depot has on the shelf, you don't get fancy. Yeah. <laughs> so it's people help from It here's been my experience is I get people who do a lot of internet research and they like send away from one from far away that's like half a percent more efficient. And then that's the one in hundred units that breaks. And the ones they sell at Lowe's and Home Depot, they have a service contract with a good HVAC contractor who comes and fix it. And the ones that are less common, they don't, and then they're stuck trying to find somebody. And the good HVAC contractor just are going to do it, so they get one. It's very good, and they're not happy. So, like, literally, the handful of people I've had who have used weird brands that aren't off the shelf at Lowe's and Home Depot always seem to be the ones who have problems and everybody else it seems to go fine. So don't get fancy. I honestly they're all so much more efficient than a regular electric water heater that you don't have to split hairs over which one is better than which one. Speaking to uh, indoor air quality and comfort, you're also going to get uh, passive interior air, so you're dehumidifying the space that it's in, which is nice if it's in a basement. Yes. And um what's the other thing that I just think? Passive dehumidification is probably a big Passive one. Passive dehumidification. But also just don't read online reviews about them and don't let your clients read online reviews about them. <laughs> because all the stuff people complain about like might not apply to you and it's stuff that people can easily see and all the stuff that's great people don't understand. So they're three times more efficient as a re than a regular water heater and they passively dehumidify the room they're in, which is awesome for everyone. Um, they are a little louder, but they're quieter than an air handler. So if it's in a mechanical room that has a furnace or a heat pump, I don't want to hear it. Like, the sound is a non-issue. Um, I wouldn't put one in a bedroom closet, but, you know, most of the places where people put them, I have no concerns. And, and the humidification is really nice. And they do require a certain amount of air, like a certain size room, or you have to put a grill through a wall. Or you can duck them. Um, and I've ducked them into a sealed attic. It's a great way to dehumidify your sealed attic. It's a great way to partially dehumidify your crawl. If, I just wish they made a shorter one, because you do have to have a section in your crawl that's small. There is one. Yeah. Yeah. The geothermal desuperheater is uh, a good option to look for if you do have a client who can do geothermal. Um, what it does is it takes waste heat from the geothermal heating and cooling process and um, can preheat a tank for your hot water. So I think I measured a few years ago and our tank sits at about 108. And that's year round, it, it creates heat warms that tank both in the heating and cooling cycle. I think you get more in the summer. Yeah. It does some in the winter. Our water gets super hot sometimes from the D super here when the AC is running. I think because the tank is so hot that then it goes through. We have a actually have a gas instant hot water heater in our house. One of the things, my, probably my biggest regret was running the gas to the house, but we do still have a gas water heater. So we take this preheated tank, and if it's already hot from the geothermal unit running, and then there's the gas, instant gas water heater, can, it has to heat it a certain amount. It can't heat it 10 degrees. It has to heat it by some minute, whatever amount. So the water can sometimes come out really hot out of the shower. Um, so it is potential for 
installing, I think. Luckily, my kids are old enough to be able to turn the water down. Um, but that's more the gas's fault than the use. It is, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. right. It is, yes. There should be some. If it was in a fine house, I would probably yeah. install you something. You could fit a We have mm -hmm. solar mm -hmm. hot water, mm -hmm. and the solar tank can get up to 160 on a really hot, like today, that will happen. Um, just hot and sunny, and we have a mixing valve that never lets it get too hot. It's not perfect, so it'll be hotter today than it would be in the winter, but it's not going to scald. That's so, the question about the rebate you mentioned. You said that the Jeep rebate more than covers the cost of the Jeep. Um, um, water meter. Yeah, I don't. I'm only aware of a three hundred fifty dollar rebate. Yeah. Okay. So the Jeep rebate. Um, there are two forms of the Jeep rebate. Um, one is an equipment only rebate, so you put in a heat pump water heater, you get 350 bucks. You put in a high efficiency H, uh, heat pump or AC, you get 300 or 350 bucks. And if you're in an existing house, I think that's your only option. If you're in a new house, you can choose that option. However, you can also choose to get the whole house rebate, okay. Okay. where we do the first rating and the energy modeling, and you get paid for the savings. And these things are so efficient that the actual savings credit that you get is worth, it depends how big the house is, but it's fourteen to $1,800 is what you get if you do. That's its contribution to your whole house rebate. So if you're building a new house, it almost always is better off that you get the whole house rebate. And I think they cost about $1,200. Mm -hmm. like uh, you can, if you shop was, around on sale, a 50 gallon can maybe be a thousand to 1200. Yeah. Um, the eighties are quite a bit more. I've seen them for 1800, but still usually that's a bigger house. So it's still going pretty much pay for it. Okay. What are you seeing in the impact on the temperature in the place for the people of the water heater? Is? It's usually not bad unless it's a super small space. Um, you know, usually it's in a mechanical room, and I don't care that it's a little cooler. I just like that it's also drier. Um, Boone Guyton we did put one in a closet that was smaller than it said to put it in, and he was like, I'm going to just try to feel it out and see if I need to cut in the transfer grill. And it gets pretty cool in there, but not cool enough that anything bad has happened, so I don't think he ever did cut the transfer grill in. But he was definitely going a little off-label for what the manufacturer said to do. So if you put it in a small space, it'll pull it down, and that's why you get it back into somewhere else. But I think you can push those rules a little bit enough that that'll happen. And actually, some of the newer ones, are they'll like automatically switch over to just being a regular inefficient electric water heater if the space they're in gets cold. So you actually, like normally we want the main condition space to get that benefit of dehumidification and because it's easier for them to work when it's a little warmer but some of the newer ones you can put it in a garage you can put it in a crawl space that is not encapsulated and they'll work okay um, but when it gets more cold they drop back to the efficient mode so i think those ones might be less concerned about i think the size is i can't remember if it was measured in square feet or cubic feet but the cubic feet yeah. I believe the uh, room, we had a room that was questionable in size. It was probably about six by 12 by I was nine. gonna say, for a typical ceiling height, 70 square feet for most brands is about the line. And if you're a little bit smaller, I would do that and I about the ceiling height. Yeah, technically, I guess the inspectors can tell you you had to cut it in, but they, I've never had one book. I don't think so, they know. Yeah, yeah they're, they're not gonna touch. <laughs> Um, so there's a de-superheater, uh, a geothermal unit with a de-superheater hooked up to the tank. So these tanks don't have any elements in them. It's just a storage tank not hooked up to electricity at all, just to hold the warm water. <clears throat> so you do have to have an extra tank mm -hmm. if you have a de-superheater. And it makes, they make about, I'd say, a third of your hot water. I have a quick question about your air source. Is it is it it can heat water or air? Is that right? Was, did I understand that correctly? Um, the heat pump water heater. No, the air source unit you were talking about, the outdoor, the mini split unit that can heat do raise. Oh, the one we did um, yeah. recently. It heats. It heats and cools water only. 
it runs chilled water to wall mount units to provide air conditioning. And it runs warm water to domestic hot water and to the radium. So it's just strictly uh, uh, water. Water. Yes, there are no ducts. So think of it as like a mini split that has an indoor head that will make domestic hot water too. But they're all the indoor heads that have the vacant water, and then the wall mounts just take the water and circulate them. So theoretically, it could operate in both radiant and domestic. Capacity. Capacity. Yeah. At the same time, yeah. Cool. So gas tankless water heaters are efficient. When we first started building houses, we put them in the first probably three, um, maybe four houses, because it was, um, I don't know, at the time, fracking hadn't been in the news quite so much and I didn't think quite so much about gas use. Um, also at the time induction cooking technology was really new and I wasn't, um, we're big cooks um, and I wasn't sold. I'd never been able to try it and so it's hard to give up gas. So that's why we did it. Had gas run to our personal home um, and installed the gas tank with water heater. So um, they are efficient and if you have gas, it's a good way to go um, to minimize your electric usage. However, I am biased now. I think I really, I really think trying to go all electric is the way to go for, for the future and get off the gas. The one place where I still love gas tankless and do like push my clients to it is for second homes where people aren't going to be because like why keep a tank hot all the time? That thing you just turn it off. Um, so yes, it's a little bit of fossil fuel use when they're there, but they're not getting used that much and it's just less waste all around. Um, also sometimes for like a tiny home, it's really hard to find space for anything else. Um, so I've had a few tiny homes do it. Although I don't like having two utilities in a tiny home either, so. You can get a <coughs> We've all You can, shop. and a lot of my tiny homes electric tankless. They're not nearly as efficient as a heat pump water heater, but if you have one bathroom. If it's an intermittent use yeah. place. So there's a picture of a gas tankless water heater. So solar thermal is another way to get hot water. Um, and I think it's a great a great thing to do. Uh, however, isn't it about the same price to put on PV to power your heat pump water heater as it is to It's probably cheaper to do PV to power a heat pump water heater than it is to do solar thermal. I have solar thermal in my house um, because at the time Duke had a nice rebate for it. There's a lot of moving parts. There's maintenance that a homeowner has to commit to. Like it will have more breakdowns because it's a bunch of parts that are put together. I think for the average homeowner, it's not something I ever encourage. Um, for someone who is a tinkerer and who likes the idea of it, fine. Um, but also in those cases, a lot of times it's a couple and one of them is the tinkerer. And if they're older, like, is the other one going to commit to that and that other person is there? Um, it's also still, solar thermal also still really makes sense out in the co-op territories. So if you're in a Haywood EMC or French Broad co-op, the buyback arrangements for solar PV are not good. Um, and cost-wise, solar thermal still makes a ton of sense there. So those are the situations where I think it still makes sense. Solar thermal. Do you know who's that? I think I got that from a manufacturer. <laughs> okay. It's impossible to take photos of mine. It's so far up there. Um, so another important strategy is efficient appliances. So starting out with just kind of everything in your house being Energy Star is a good base, but then kind of going beyond that if you can. If you're the person choosing, um, obviously look and try to find the lowest energy that you can. Um, a lot of times it's your client choosing. Um, and I, I just tell them you have to choose Energy Star. I don't, I don't micromanage them any further than that. If it's a client making the decision. 